If you've got your Bible, open to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Um, if you're new to us, we have just begun our trek through Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Um, if you're not familiar with the letter, the first letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians, that's okay. Stick with us. You're going to learn a lot about um, a culture that existed over 2,000 years ago that is remarkably similar in so many ways at the very core to the kind of culture that we live in today and a church that's trying to be the body of Christ, trying to represent Jesus well around a city and surrounded by people that are in every way antagonistic towards it and who are trying to live a life that is so decisively different that it stands out and it's challenging to do that. And and so that, in that sense, it's not so different than the kind of pressures that we face today. And one of the themes that we find again and again, and it's not just in 1 Corinthians we see this, Paul wrote this in just about every letter, Uh, Something about the necessity for God's people to be unified, to to come together in a way that marks them as God's people, to come together in a way that says there's something uniquely and decisively different about being a Christian that unites people in a way that nothing else in all this world could ever unite people. Now, I titled this message today, The Crux of Christian Unity. I like that word crux. It's probably not a word that we use a lot in everyday language, but it's one of those old words that has a lot of weight and meaning to us. So a crux, it's the, it's the most essential, most decisive uh, issue at hand. It, it's, it's the central part of an argument or a concept. It's something everything else hangs on. And that's what I'm going to talk to you today about in relationship to what it means to be a Christian. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10 is where we're going to begin our reading today. And so um, if you have your Bible, read along with me. If not, you can follow along on the the, uh, screen behind me. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it's been reported to me by Chloe's people that there's quarreling among you, my brothers, What I mean is that each of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius so that there may be no, so that no one may say that you're baptized in my name. Now I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Now, if you've been in church any time at all in your life, you've probably heard the cry for unity. Um, You've heard it here. You've heard people say, you know, for a church to be healthy and effective and to honor God, it's got to be unified. You've got to have unity. But my question to you is this. Unity around what? I mean, it can't just be generic unity. It can't just be unity for the sake of unity. I mean, even the, even the secular world, when I say secular, I don't mean that, that is a derogatory term. I mean, those who have no uh, biblical worldview, those who don't have Christ at the center of their thinking, those who make no pretense of being Christian, I mean, even the secular world gets unified around things, right? I mean, all you got to do is watch a 100,000 people in a stadium in Brazil screaming for a a soccer match and see what unity looks like. Um, You could see a a political march and see a group of people unified, sometimes even with the other side being unified just across the street. Um, You get a superficial issue that pops up on Twitter or Instagram and and all of a sudden people are unified. That was the worst national anthem I've ever heard. Or that was the best national anthem. I didn't hear that unity. I did hear the first. But, and we'll get unified around these things. And people will rally around, around the cause. But most of the unity in this world is superficial. And it's temporal. I mean, it's about things that really in the big scheme of things don't matter all that much. And they certainly don't matter for forever. And that's the kind of unity that the world knows. But what about unity in a church? I mean, what's supposed to be different there? Now, if you've ever been part of a church or if you feel like the church you're in now sometimes struggles with discord or conflict or lack of unity, let me tell you a little story that will help you realize that maybe it's not quite as bad as you think. 
Now, I'm going to read you a little account from the news uh, about a certain ex-pastor, and um, you'll understand in just a moment why he's ex-pastor. Former pastor Eric Daniel Harris, age 37, pled guilty to the November arson that burned down the Kentucky Missionary Baptist Church in Saline County. Now think about this just for a minute. 37-year-old pastor, guilty, arson, burns down the church. Now you might be thinking, what would possess a pastor to burn down a church? You know, maybe he was, you know, maybe he was Methodist and the Baptists across the street were getting on his nerves. Maybe he was Pentecostal and he was tired of them uh, saying you shouldn't be speaking in tongues. Maybe they just were grabbing up some of his members and his church was shrinking and theirs was, theirs was growing. But oh no, not the case. For the church that Pastor Eric burned down was his own church. And here's what the federal prosecutor said. According to federal prosecutor, Harris said he did what he did because, quote, there was a division among church members and I felt like they needed a project to unify them. <laughs> it must have gotten pretty bad at the Missionary Baptist Church in Salem County for the pastor to say, all right, here's what I'm going to do. I'll burn this thing down and maybe we've got a cause we can gather back around. You know, even in church today, We've got to ask the question, what, what sort of unity? I read this from an old country preacher this week. He said, two chickens tied at the legs and thrown over a clothesline might be united, but they sure don't have unity. Same thing for us. What sort of unity? You know, unity is not just a theme, by the way, of 1 Corinthians. It's also a theme of Ephesians, Galatians, etc. In the book of Ephesians, scriptures talk about being eager for unity, maintain the unity and the spirit of peace and John Piper gave a sermon on this. I want to read just a brief section of what he said at the beginning of his introduction. He said, unity among two or more people gets its virtue entirely from something else. Unity itself is neutral until it's given goodness or badness by something else. So if Herod and Pilate are unified by their common scorn for Jesus, this is not good unity, right? But if Paul and Silas are singing together in a prison, well, that's, that's good unity, he said, therefore, it's never enough to simply call Christians to have unity. That might be good or bad. The unified vote 50 years ago in my home church in South Carolina to forbid blacks from attending services was not good unity. Likewise, the unified vote of a mainline Protestant den denomination today to bless forbidden sexual acts is not good unity. So what sort of unity are we talking about? Well, notice I, I chose that word, the crux of Christian unity, and, and I did it for a reason. If you're familiar with the etymology of that word, crux, from, crux comes from the root crucis, from which we get crucifixion. Crucis literally means out of the cross. You see, it's been known since the beginning of Christianity that there's one thing that brings everybody together in a way that nothing else possibly could. It's not a common moral code. It's not a common social or demographic background. It's not common race. It's not common gender. It's not any other human commonalities. The one thing that brings people together that allows the scriptures to say, in Christ, there is no slave or free. There is no Jew or Greek. There is no male or female. There are none of these worldly distinctions anymore. The one thing that causes that to happen is the cross of Christ. So crux means from the cross, and the center of our unity is what Jesus did for us when he died for us and rose again. And so our unity is different. Our unity is in Jesus, and that makes our unity eternal. And there's no bigger cause, there's no bigger centrality, there's no bigger decisive or deciding factor than that. Our foundation is Jesus. And in reality, that ought to be enough. Now listen to what I'm saying. I get that part of our broken human nature leads sometimes to conflict in relationships. And so closely identifying with our feelings or opinions or ideas that we cannot stand someone to disagree. And, and I know we're prone to, to hurt feelings and sometimes easy or ready uh, offendability. I, I get all that. But what's the solution to all that? What's the remedy to all that? It comes to understanding who are we that's bigger than all of those things. It's who we are it's who we are in Christ. That ought to be enough. If you were here last week, you got to hear Dan talk from the passage of Scripture just preceding this one. And I want to remind you of something in that text, just a bridge between what he said and what I'm saying today. So if you got your Bible, again, look back just a few verses, starting at verse 4. Listen to what Paul said. 
Listen to how Paul begins this letter. Listen to how Paul is, is laying a foundation that he will build every other statement or argument on. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace that God, the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. What I'm most thankful for for you, he says, is that you have been given grace by God, and that came through Christ, that in every way you were enriched in him. You've got all speech, all knowledge. He says the testimony about Christ was confirmed. I mean, what Jesus does for people is, is, is validated in you. I mean, look around. You came from so many different backgrounds and so many different religious experiences, and you're different racially, and you're different economically, and you're different educationally, and you, know, you come from all these different worlds together in this very cosmopolitan city called Corinth. But look, you now are a people identified as Christ's people. Look at this. It's, it's playing out. This Christianity thing, it's real, it's true. It's not just ideas or concepts. You're not lacking in any gift. He'll get the spiritual gifts in chapter 12. God's given you the tools, not just the psychological tools or the physical tools or even the intellectual ones. He's giving you the supernatural spiritual ones that make a church a church and different from a club or an organization. He's done this for you, and he'll sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. It means you'll be forever covered by the payment of Christ for your sins, who's rendered you not guilty before God, and that's not going to change. And God is faithful. And catch this last part. By whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. One of the great blessings of God, one of the great gifts of grace that happened to you when you became a Christian. If you're a Christian, this is one of the graces that God gave you. It's called church. And that's not something that you just go to. That's not something that you're a consumer in. Uh, that, that's not something that you partake on your own um, agenda. That, that's not something that you pick and choose from as if it were a purveyor of religious goods and services, that you can pick and choose what you like and what you don't like, that you can listen to the messages you like, reject the ones you don't. Um, you can be around the people you like and stay away from the ones you don't. Uh, you can pick and choose what missions you'll support or what activities you'll be involved in, the ones you won't. No, he says, this is not something that you go to. This is something you have become, and it's my gift to you. It's my gift to you. And then he gets to the real key issue here, which, by the way, if this sounds like sort of the, the deep waters of Christianity or the extra stuff or, you know, the optional kind of things, I assure you what I'm saying today is not. Because the very core issue that affected their unity is what affected every other troubled behavior and activity in that church. Every one of them. And we're going to see some that are just, they're just, they're mind-boggling. I mean, some are like the routine stuff we deal with today. You've got church members in conflict with one another. And instead of resolving it as Christian people ought to, according to the guidance of Scripture, which is emphatically clear, they take each other to the court. And Paul says, you shouldn't be doing that. This is some sexually deviant behavior. Where Paul says, you know, even in this city, which is pretty godless and pretty pagan, in fact, it was probably the peak of godlessness at its time. Even they look at what you're doing and say, you've got to be kidding me. Of course, I paraphrase. That's not in the original. You've got to be kidding me that you live that way. We don't even do that. And we go to a temple where part of our worship is prostitution. We don't do what you guys are doing. Listen, all those things come down to the same core root. And it's the same solution. It's the fuel that makes a church unified. It's what keeps the fires of the body of Christ burning. It's what keeps the connection real and rich and deep. And it's what drives everything in a healthy believer and in a healthy collection of believers called a church. And it is this. Okay, you ready? It is learning how to think Christianly. Now write that phrase down. Say that it sounds less than profound. Write it down. Because I'm going to hit that theme again and again. Thinking Christianly. Because that was their struggle. When you have these conflicts and, and this discord that you've got, it's showing that your thinking is not like Christ. Later on, he'll challenge them to have the mind of Christ. Your thinking is not like Christ. In fact, your thinking is like the world. When these issues rise up and you deal with them, you're not dealing with them as Christ would deal with them if he were you in that situation, if Christ were living that situation through you. You're dealing with them like you're somebody out in the world who doesn't even know Christ. That's why he says this in verse 10. Look at the verse again. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is not just Paul's personal appeal, by the way. 
You know, Paul mentions a little bit later that some of you say, I am of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Paul, I'm of Jesus. That means I'm guessing that Paul is getting about a fourth of the vote, the popular vote. This was not personal. This is not because you don't like me. This is not because you're not supporting me. That's not the issue. The issue is this, he says, I appeal to you in the name of Jesus that all of you agree there be no divisions among you, that you be united. How? Because you're all doing the same task? Because you all are pretty much the same kind of people? Because you all grew up the same way? Because you all hold the same values? No, he says, I want you to do this. I want you to have the same mind, the same judgment. That is thinking biblically. And understand this. The issues of, of discord and conflict in the church at Corinth were, were real. Any of you who've been around conflict and discord, you know the effects that it, that it can have. And you've got people with hurt feelings. Um, you've got people sometimes they'll just quit going to church because I'm just tired of the arguing. Man, you know, if I want that kind of mess, I, I get that at work. I don't need to go to church for that. Sometimes people are offended and find it difficult to forgive. I haven't met many people that like to live in the tension of conflict. Sometimes uh, the fissure of conflict even separates families. You know, I kind of have a running joke. I, I don't mean to offend anybody if this is you, your family, your friends, but just about wherever I go, I'm always trying to study and look at and learn things about church. Just about whenever I see a church that's called New Hope or New Something, that means there was an old fight somewhere <laughs> that split the church 50 yards down the road in two, and now you're the new version of that mess. And that's what we do. That's how we are. But understand this. As real as conflict can be, and people with hurt feelings, broken relationships, people who don't speak to each other in the grocery store anymore, and all those different offshoots of what conflict does, and there are many. Notice what Paul doesn't do. Paul doesn't say, you guys need to get along because I'm tired of hearing about how upset so-and-so is. You, you need to get along because the church is not doing well and giving is down. Because of your conflict. You need to do well because if you haven't looked, people aren't coming like they used to come. And it's because of your conflict. You, you need to do well because you know, our, your Corinthian neighbors who are trying to decide, are they going to the temple this week to worship their false god or going to come worship together with you are saying, mm, I don't need that. i got enough drama in my life. He doesn't say that. Even though all those things could and very well were real, just like they're real today. Paul's appeal is a theological one not a pragmatic one. Do you see what I'm saying? We're not going to just address the effects. We're not just going to say, hey, you two, you stop it. You two, these two groups, you got to get together and fix that. Or you know what? If you feel that way, just zip it. Keep it to yourself and don't bring that mess in here. We're not just going to fix the, the effects. He says, look, we've got to get to the cause. And the cause of that is this. You're not thinking Christianly. I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm not saying that the Spirit of Christ doesn't dwell in you. I, I'm not saying that you don't have a God-given connection as brothers and sisters in Christ. What I'm saying is you have not yet learned to transform your thinking into the mind of Christ. What would Jesus have me do in this situation? What is right? What's Christian? It's not like what I used to be because that's my old nature. And it's not like what the world is around me because that's a broken nature. It's a new nature. It's the nature of Christ. And that's why I say this. The absence of sound teaching, sound doctrine. Maybe the better word would be sound theology because theology is the, the art or the science even of thinking about God and Christ. The absence of sound theology will inevitably, invariably lead to discord. Because if we're not thinking like we ought to think, we're not going to feel what we ought to feel. Our attitudes are not going to be the attitudes that ought to be expressed, and so our actions aren't going to be right. And you see this word, he says, I hear that there's discord there. So I'm doing this little word study like preachers do and trying to figure out this word discord. I, may, I know what it means. I, I've got a fairly good grasp on English. But this is not an uncommon word in Scripture, and it's used in different places and times. So I'm trying to break this word down. And as it turns out, this idea of discord is not just that people aren't getting along. So it's not just like a passive sense, right? There's, discord exists. I've been hurt, or um, someone has treated me poorly, or we're just not getting along. It's not a passive sense of discord. It's a very active one, and it's based on 
attitudes. And it's, it's, it's causing other people to be in discord. It's a pervasive, active sowing of discord. That, so when Paul says, um, some of you say you're of Apollos, some of you are of Cephas, some of you are of me, some of you are of Jesus. Yeah, I don't know what he's saying. I mean, I would just be guessing really to speculate. Apollos, from what little we know of him and his ministry and history, he probably was the most articulate of the group. He probably was the most impressive in front of people. And certainly he had led his share of people to Christ. Paul, incidentally, was probably the least impressive in front of people, though probably the most intelligent, but he even speaks of his lack of impressiveness in appearance and words. Uh, Cephas was probably the one most likely to take his group of followers and charge hell with a water pistol, but he was also probably the most unhinged of all those leaders. And then, of course, there's Jesus, so that's, that's probably the super spiritual ones that says, I don't follow no man but Jesus. But the reality is this. This is not passive. This is active. And so they're saying, why do you follow him? Why do you listen to that guy? Why do you trust him? And it's breaking down, it's breaking down the church. And here's what's interesting about it, too, just as a side note. When you have that sort of conflict and discord in a body of believers, it's foolishness to think that the outside world won't see it or notice it. I mean, it's just foolish. I mean, think even what Paul said here about how he came to be aware of this. He said, you know, some of Chloe's people are talking about this. Some of Chloe's people. And that got me thinking, you know, when a church is having conflict, what that means in our context is, you know, some of those people having breakfast at Ray's are talking about this. You know, some, some, of those people, uh, some of those people at the ball field over there on Westgate, you know, they're talking about this. You know, some of those people over at the hospital, when they, when they get together in the break rooms, they're, they're talking about this. Because that's the way the world works. And the church is on display. The church is meant to be a display of God's glory in the world. And so people are going to talk about this. And it's, and it's public. And it's known. And by the way, if some would interpret this, well, it's just simply factions. It's just normal. I mean, I've got certain people I like more than you like. I mean, there are certain pastors I like. You know, people are forever asking me, well, who, who do you listen to? What kind of pastors do you like? And I say, well, one, I'm too ADD to listen, so I appreciate you guys listening to me. I couldn't listen to me, but you do, so awesome. Thank you. People ask me, say, well, do you listen to your sermons afterwards? I say, no, never. I'm way too critical. I never listen to them, so I hope they're okay with you. You're still here, so cool. Um, <laughs> But I don't listen to many pastors. I read because I read faster than I can hear or something like that. So I like to read. And, but this is not just factions here. This verse 12, this represents Christians that are thinking and acting like the lost world around them. They're acting and thinking like the lost world around them. Building some up, tearing some down. Finding faults, holding grudges. Being easily offended and hard Forgiving. I mean, this is what they're doing. And it says, the issue is how you think. The issue goes to the core. Why were they doing this? Well, I suppose at least three things appear in this text, at least to me, implicit or explicit, I think they're there. And one is a lack of trust in those leaders. And that's the only reason they would say, I'm of him, I'm of him, I'm of him. No, they, there was a lack of trust. And I'm not saying these were perfect men. They weren't. Of that list of four great spiritual leaders, Apollos, Paul, Peter, Peter, Cephas, only Jesus is the perfect one. I, I get that. I'm not saying these are perfect leaders, but that's hardly at issue here. There's a lack of trust in them. I think even more so than that, there's a wrong view of the church. I alluded to it earlier. Well, maybe more than alluded, spoke frankly about it. It's kind of interesting to me that Paul is trying to teach from the very beginning. I mean, keep in mind that the context here. These are new believers. Some came out of Judaism and were very religious. Some came out of pagan, very godless, but religion expressions, religious expressions. Some came out of nothing into this. I mean, the disparity among people and understandings and beliefs was, you know, was great. And they're coming now under something that, again, is just bigger than saying, uh, here's a moral code we're going to live by. Here, here's a social norm that we're going to adhere to. Um, they're coming under something totally different. The lordship of God himself in Christ Jesus to rule and reign over us, to tell us how we will live and how we won't live, and to surrender our lives to him. And in so doing, not only did we become right with God, the Father himself, not only were we reconciled to God and our sins forgiven, and he is relating to us like, 
like a father to so many lost sons and daughters, now restored to him. But now I have a family because Jesus Christ is the head of a church, which he calls a body. And I'm part of that now with you and you and you and you and all of these imperfect parts. And some are weak and some are sick and some are not doing their part, and some are struggling, and that's called disease. When some part of your body is not not working as it ought to, you you call that that disease, right? So uh, the body deals with these sort of diseases, and yet we're all together in this one thing called the church. That's interesting. Obviously, Paul's trying to establish this understanding in the first century, and they didn't have it yet. If you come full circle now, 2,000 years later, it's amazing to me that so often we're seeing evidence in modern church life, particularly the, particularly I would say the westernized version of the church. We we don't see this so much, I I don't think, in Eastern Christian church where they understand community and family and, and the heart of the gospel better. But I think in the westernized church, we are so consumeristic that we started very subconsciously, if not consciously, Seeing church as something for us, something I can pick and choose what I want, what I get from it, and it's just something I go to. If I get something out of it, good. If I don't get something out of it, I can go to another one rather than something I'm a part of, something that I am with my brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and they didn't understand that yet. They didn't understand the, the very nature of church, and, and I think even more so than that was a fundamental misunderstanding of the gospel itself. I mean, it's, it's the gospel. It's, it's they didn't really understand what the gospel does. They didn't have a fully orbed picture of the gospel. When you say yes to the offer of salvation in Christ Jesus, when you come to the humble recognition that you, like all the rest of us, have sinned before a holy God and will face his judgment, and that you can't unsin or outsin your sin with good, And the only remedy for that sin is forgiveness. And the only offer of legitimate forgiveness is Christ Jesus, who was sinless but died as a sacrifice for our sins. And you say yes to that offer of salvation and say, God save me, I believe in Jesus, who died for me and rose again. They didn't fully understand what happens then. Now the greatest benefit of the gospel, the good news, is that you get God. The Bible says that Jesus Christ died for us, the just Jesus, for the unjust me, the perfectly good for the horrifically evil me, he did that for me in order to bring me to God. So God is the great end of the gospel. We get God. And, of course, we get heaven because that's where God is, and that's the gift that God wants to give us, everlasting joy and enjoyment with him in heaven. But we get another blessing that Paul spoke about in verses 4 through 9. We get each other. Yay. Look around. That's the blessing of God for you. It's the intent of God for you. And it's the only way for you to ever be who God made you to be. Because you need the shaping, and you need the correcting, and you need the discipline, and you need the encouragement, and you need the help, and you need the conversations, the interactions, and the partnering, and the one anothering, and the loving, and the serving, and the sacrificing, and the forgiving, and all those things together to be what God made you to be. It doesn't happen in a vacuum, and it doesn't happen with just you by yourself and God. Church is God's gift. Christianity is never... You and God, we're like this. Me and God, we're good. I don't need anything else. That's not Christianity. And they misunderstood that. So what's the remedy to this? What's the solution? Again, as I've already said, Paul's answer to the problem is not simply band-aiding the symptoms. Okay, It's it's not just saying, stop that, do this better. Um, Let's have a seminar. Let's go on a retreat. Um, let's, Let's group hug. Um, he doesn't do these things. Those may happen later as a result or as a fruit. But he knows those are just symptoms. And the, the real symptom, again, goes to a core issue. Those symptoms point to something more. Not thinking Christianly. Not thinking as Christ would shape our thinking, as Scripture would guide our thinking. And so Paul asks um, two critical questions, really kind of two and a half questions. Is Christ divided? It's a contrast. You're divided. Some of you are in this group. Some of you are in this one. You're taking sides. You're undercutting others. You're, you, you've got discord so much so that people know it. And again, while I said his point was theological, because that's where the solutions are, not pragmatic, it doesn't mean there weren't pragmatic effects. It doesn't mean there weren't hurt people, angry people. 
broken people. It doesn't mean that their ministry wasn't crippled. It doesn't mean that their giving wasn't down. It doesn't mean that their fellowship wasn't threatened. He just doesn't go into those things. He says, was, was Christ divided? And, and by the way, this is not some sort of... Uh, this is not some sort of philosophical, existential question he's asking. Was Christ divided? Well, yes, he's his body. So, no, no, not, that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about the very nature of what church is. You were baptized into Christ. You are you're saved because of the crucifixion of Christ. Uh, the new life that you have is because of the resurrection of Christ. You are in Christ. You don't just believe things about Christ. Okay, you're not just a follower of Christ. Um, you're not just going to a church um, that idolizes or, or um, worships Christ. You are in Christ. That's a body. He's the head. You're part of that body. This is, this is something he's made you. It, it's supernatural. This, this is, if, if you're thinking, well, that's not what I signed up for. You'd be exactly right because you can't sign up for this. You're made into this by Christ. And he says, okay, let's look at the very nature of, of Christ. Is he then divided? No. No, he's not. I mean, this world is divided. That's natural. Families are divided. Some of you are in families right now where you wish the conflict wasn't there. You wish the tension wasn't there. And you wish forgiveness could flow. And you wish things could be different. I mean, that's the world even at its best. But in Christ, he says, let's, let's think deeply, theologically for a minute. What does it mean to be in Christ that's not divided? Christ is one. Our faith is one. There's one Lord. There is one Spirit. There is one baptism. There is one God and Father of all. It's one. The Trinity, it's, it's one. It's, it's God in oneness. One God. And then he asked a question that also is very pointed. He said, and was Paul crucified for you? And what is he saying there? Where... Where's your ultimate allegiance? I mean, what is this really all about here? I mean, I, I know that we have natural ties. And some of those are just because there are some people we get along with better. And some pastors are easier to like, and some of us are not as easy to like. And some teachers you just naturally connect with because the way they teach or the stories that they tell or because they're like you or because they like you or you know, whatever it may be. I mean, all these things are natural. We get that. He's saying, listen, we have to go beyond all that stuff on this level. we got to go all the way to this level and say, all right, who is at the center of it all? It's Christ was crucified for me. And under the cross of Christ, we now become one. Think about the things that divide people in our, in our culture today. How about race? Does race not divide people today? Are people not in conflict because of the color of skin? Well, sure. Well, sure. On the one hand, you can say it's nothing new. But on another hand, you can say, why is it not getting better? We talk about it. We emphasize it. We try to legislate it. Why does it not get better? And, you know, even the world would say, hey, people ought to get together and color skin ought not to divide people. And they might say things like this, you know, that's just the right thing to do. And the vast majority of sane thinking people would say, yes, you're right. It's, it's good. It's, it's human. We ought to get along. We're one human family. And all that would be right and true. But I would tell you as a Christian, all of that is insufficient unity. Because we've actually got something bigger than that. We've got the cross of Christ under which we are made brothers and sisters. Under which there is no difference in distinction in the eyes of God. And see, that's even better than man's best intentions. That's even better than man's best efforts. And that ought to mark everything that happens among Christians. It's, it's different because of Jesus. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? We baptized in my name? No, it's, it's Jesus. And if we all have an allegiance to Jesus, and we're trying to think like Jesus would have us to think, well, guess what that does? It's like A.W. Tozer said. If you've got a thousand pianos and you're tuning them with one fork, they're going to play the same tune. And that one fork is it's, it's Christ. It's the center. It's, it's who we are. It's what we are. So what do we do with this? What's the, what's the remedy to this? I wrote down three thoughts that I think summarize what I've been trying to say today and what I believe this passage is teaching. So if you're taking notes, I encourage you to include this. 
If we want true biblical unity, not short-lived, not superficial, if we want true biblical unity, we've got to consider Christ and the very nature of the church first. So I was thinking about this on the way over here this morning. I, Cecilia and I were talking, and um, I said, you know what? I wonder if people think, yeah, this, this doesn't help me. I mean, I got, I got stuff going on in my life right now that I need to fix. I got problems, you know. And he's going to be talking about thinking theologically about church. And then I started thinking, one of the reasons churches like us, people like us, churches like ours, have struggled over the years with ebbs and flows of discord and conflict is because we don't think theologically, because we didn't lay that foundation that says, whoa, time out. I don't care what you do at work, and I don't care how it happens on your ball team, and I don't care what your business is like or how your family handles it, but we are Christians here, and we're going to handle things according to the book. We're going to be guided by the spirit that inspired the book, and we're going to honor the author of that book, our Father God. We're going to glorify him in what we do. We're going to think differently. So we have to consider the very nature of who is Christ, the undivided one, and what does it mean to be church? Not something I go to, but something that God has made me and something that is a blessing to me. It's part of his graces to me. It's part of how God has left me not lacking what I need to be what he wants me to be. That's grace. And the second thing is this. We have to recognize the centrality of the cross and its defining work for us to save us and in us to change us. Now, again, I know that's, that's like big thinking. So, I, I, okay, we're talking about a very specific problem here, Paul. I, let, me, let me tell you the issue here. It's me and the, him, and here's what he's been saying. Here's what I've been saying. I get it. And you're talking about here in these cosmic themes. No, listen, that cosmic answer is the answer to your minuscule problem. Are we or are we not in Christ? Are we or are we not redeemed people? Are we or are we not forgiven people in the exact same way because of Christ? And that's the defining issue. And finally, number three, we have to reassess our commitment to the gospel itself as the very core of our mission, which I would add is being compromised by discord. It wasn't the primary point that Paul made in the text, but certainly is underlying. Even Paul's last words in this little section, which you might find a little bit odd. You know, Paul says this, and I, I'll paraphrase, I'll summarize, and I'm going to conclude. Here's what he says. Okay, I, I didn't baptize only a few of you. And I don't know if Paul has a bad memory or what. I'm not sure if I baptized anybody else or not, but that's not the point is what he's saying. The point is that this was not my primary purpose. This was not my primary mission to baptize you. you see, that sounds odd. My primary purpose is the gospel. And I want to make sure that when I'm conveying, communicating the gospel, I'm not trying to impress anybody with my worldly wisdom. I don't want the cross to be emptied of its inherent power. I just want to put it out there. This is who you are. This is who God is. This is what he's done for you in Jesus. This is why you need it, and this is how you can have it. It's the cross. It's the center of everything. And I want to make sure that people are converted not by my opinions or my attitude is not persuaded by me, but are converted under the cross, the only thing that can save them. So this is what I do. And in so saying, he's saying this. This baptism, listen, when you're baptized, that's not just a, a generic recognition of your new relationship with God. It's not just that. You've been baptized into something. You've been baptized into a family. You've been baptized into the faith. You've been baptized into the body. And I believe that's part why Paul was saying, I leave baptism to these guys. These guys are going to be your pastors, Apollos and others, Timothy, the John Marks, the Barnabases, whoever would be the pastors and elders of those churches. You will be the ones. That you're baptized into that body. My goal is the gospel. Why do you think Paul ties, my ultimate goal is the gospel, in the same breath he's talking about unity, if unity does not harm the cause of the gospel? See, that's just it. And, and let me explain what I mean by that so it's clear. I'm not just simply saying when a church is at odds with itself, when there's conflict, that it won't move forward as it should, even though it won't. And I'm not saying there won't be effects that would be tangible or measurable for all of us to see, like attendance or giving or missions offerings or missions participation or all those things, because we would. All those things are real. I'm talking about more than that. 
I'm talking about when a person is in conflict with another believer in a church or a leader in the church, or when a person is at odds, feeling discord, um, when a person is unsettled, when, when there, there are issues that are unresolved. You put whatever tag or description you want, but you get what I'm saying. When things aren't as they ought to be in a person, we're fighting, bickering among us. It is virtually impossible that we will still be on mission personally. I, I can't be bogged down in this stuff here and also have my eye on the gospel gospel prize, the gospel goal. I won't be doing both, is what I'm saying. I won't be engaged in, in mentoring uh, that middle schooler um, and being on the front lines of the gospel, teaching them how to do math, but also teaching them what a Christian is, who God is, and how much God loves them. I won't be doing that at the same time while I'm working the phone lines, talking about the things I don't like at my church. You, you follow what I'm saying? Those two things don't typically coexist. All legitimate unity flows from what I'm saying here. All of it. All legitimate unity. Not the sort of superficial unity, not, hey, let's burn this down and everybody pick up a hammer. We got a project. We're going to build a building. Uh, we're going to take a trip. I got a new slogan and t shirts are in the foyer. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about something bigger than that. I'm talking about this. I'm talking about who we are because of Jesus and how that drives, how that drives everything. My final point is this, and I'm done. I said I'd conclude a minute ago, and I went too long, so this is it. While the lack of unity, the presence of discord, has a public or a common effect, hitting many, to the point even where Paul's hearing about it from hundreds of miles away, the fact that it has a public or common effect doesn't mean that it doesn't have a personal or a private solution. Okay, I can talk all day long about, guys, we got to be unified. we got to be connected. We can't be two chickens thrown over a clothesline with their ankles tied together. we got to be together. But where that unity is going to happen is person to person. Every believer in this room asking of God, what am I supposed to do? What about me, God? What's my response to this? How am I supposed to react? What, what is my role? If I'm supposed to be working eagerly for unity in the spirit of peace, okay, God, show me and point me in the way you can use my eager efforts to bring unity. What am I going to do personally? So I say this as a challenge to the believers in this room first. The problem affects us all, but the solution starts with each of us personally. The second thing I want to say if you're not a Christian yet and you're hearing what I'm saying, say, man, I just like stepped into like church methodology 101 here. Now, I want to point out something that I hope you heard a little bit in what I said. And when you come to Jesus, you get so much more than, man, I, I couldn't sit here for a thousand sermons and tell you the content of what you receive when you come to Christ. And obviously, God himself is far and away top of that list. And all the benefits of God that we receive. But I, want you, I don't want you to miss something else. Maybe you've had a slightly wrong perception of the church, or maybe you've heard something different from other pastors, preachers, teachers, evangelists, whatever, over the years that the church was some sort of secondary issue, um, some sort of option. You know, if it helps you, if it benefits you, hey, come on, you know, it's, it's a good thing. No, I'm telling you it's a necessary thing. It's a God-given thing. It's part of God's grace to you. And while we were imperfect, we happily accept another imperfect part to the body. But together, together we're the church. Together we're the hope of the world. Together we're the display of God's glory in a dark world. Together we do this. It's not just about you. It's about us doing this together. It's about many brothers and sisters in the faith. It's about spiritual fathers and mothers. It's about spiritual little brothers and little sisters that you will mentor and develop. It's about God shaping you through the lives of other people, and that's what God did for us. And the more we understand that, and the more we appreciate it, the more we'll know that the blessing that God gave us is real. It's called the church, and that's a grace, and I want you to be part of it. I'm going to ask you to just close your eyes for a moment. We're going to respond. You guys have been great and gracious to sit and listen. Now I want you to respond to what God's saying to you. What is God telling you to do? We're going to do a, just a song in closing. It's only closing up this sermon teaching time. It's really the catalyst, the launching of what we're going to do with it from here. And I ask you to respond in a couple of ways today, okay? First one is this, Christian, is there some commitment that you need to make based on what you heard today? Is there some decision that you need to commit to God today based on what you heard today? Is there something you need to confess 
based on what you heard today. Someone you need to go to. Is there something you need to resolve? What is the Spirit of God telling you? I'm sure I left a lot of gaps and a lot of holes. But God's Spirit can close them all in very quickly if we'll listen to him today. What does he want you to do with what you've heard? Now what? Now what, God? Show me what you want me to do. And will you do that today? Will you take action on that today?